we're talking to S. Brian Wilson here, and uh, Brian is a, a longtime anti-war activist, and he's, uh, you've written a couple books, and uh, I think you're, there's been at least one movie made about you, is that right? Yeah. More than one? <laughs> Uh, well, there was one made in 1988, um, so long ago I can't even remember the name of it, um, and, then, and then the one in 2016. <clears throat> and you also have a blog, and you're a lawyer, and um, at well, late... my blog is Facebook. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's what I was going to say. Uh, uh, you've, you've lately <laughs> been sort of turning Facebook into a blog, which actually is pretty good, because... You know that's uh, how it kind of got you got my attention again, and there's it's really great stuff that you've been putting out there, and uh, there's you got lots of great, really smart friends that are yeah. probably friends from years past, and that also is a great education. So um, yeah, I, I I learn a lot from the comments. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, um, you're one of the. Uh, probably least programmed people that I know, right? <laughs> and uh, that actually is a, an astounding- I don't know what you mean by that. Well, I'm just saying that, you know, this, here's, I was looking up this stuff here to have some material to talk about. I heard Noam Chomsky say years ago, you know, probably 1980, 81 or something, that uh, Americans are the most highly indoctrinated population on earth. Right. And right. then, I was trying to look this up. And, and I, was a, I was a perfect candidate for it. Yeah, and uh, me too. <laughs> but the, you said, uh, this is something he well, he said, you don't have any other society where the educated classes at least are so effectively indoctrinated and controlled by the propaganda system. That's right, exactly right. And then he's talking about the managerial class, right? which, you know, he's expounded on this quite a lot. And I have relatives that are in the managerial class, and I know that's absolutely right. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, pretty much everybody else is too. And we're seeing this thing right now where, uh, you know, you got all these people running around uh, saying that it's violating their constitutional rights to wear a mask in the middle of a pandemic. And that just kind of takes the cake. It's like, how stupid are they? Are, are they going to, if they get the virus, are they going to shoot up uh, chlorine? <laughs> is this the Jim Jones cult or something? It's like, you know, th this is like uh, new bounds here in brainwashing that I uh, see here. Well, I, in other words, you think we shouldn't be ordered to wear a mask. Is that right? Or they think that, I guess. I mean, I, I wear a mask when I leave my house here in uh, Nicaragua. Yeah. I wear a mask too. Um, and, you know, it's I, it's just common sense, though. You know, it's like exactly. Do you want to stop this epidemic, pandemic, or not? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Constitutional rights. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are suffering from four hundred years of white exceptionalism, and it's very deep. It's very comforting. Uh, and it's very difficult to break from it because it's been so, uh, it's been so rewarding. Uh, I didn't discover it until I was in Vietnam and I realized something and my conditioning was really off. Uh, you know, I was 27 at the time, but I, I, um, uh, I just knew that what we were doing and what I was participating in was was uh demonic diabolical and i and i couldn't believe that i was i was participating and um so i you know i i started questioning my own identity right while i was in vietnam because it's a fake identity this idea of white supremacy and we don't even think about it we just it just comes with being born and raised in a white family after World War II in the United States. I mean, it's, uh, at least until Reagan, it was a piece of cake. 
you know, everybody had a refrigerator and a toaster and we, and we beat the Nazis, we said, of course, it was not even true. Because the Russians beat the Nazis, really. So we were living in the fantasy of the glory of um, defeating the Nazis, a lie, but it was a great, great belief. And we had the GI Bill and we had consumerism and prosperity. And Norman Vincent Peale was saying, uh, if you have uh, material success, it means that you're, you're one with God. I mean, it, was a, it really was a fantastic fairy tale. And um, I guess uh, for me, I've had to deal with my shame. And people don't like to use the word shame, but it's very different than guilt. Shame is dealing with my false identity. It's having to reconstruct who I am as a human being uh, from the lie. Uh, guilt is something you did that you feel bad about. Uh, but shame is dealing with, holy shit, how did I, how did I become um, an ideological robot for the system, basically, and and it's propaganda. But it's in our, it's it's everything we've learned since we were born, and it's been twenty generations. This is one thing you wrote. You said uh, uh, that uh, for some or emotional or mysterious reason, the last few months I have been approaching seventy nine years. Now my eightieth year. I've been reflecting a lot on my past, both in Vietnam and in the many countries I have visited studying U.S. intervention policies. It is a kind of integration process, just sentimental meanderings before I provide nourishment for the microorganisms, <laughs> a way to better understand how my conditioning led me to Vietnam, then how my epiphany exploded in my head and heart towards suicide, ideation, and then to a life of wow perspectives. And the, the, what, was it, what did I say at the end? Oh, to a, a, a different life of, quote, wow perspectives. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, the, there's 20 vets that uh, commit suicide every day, every day in the United States from moral injury. And, right. um, you know, this epiphany that you had. Uh, it it almost killed you, right? Yeah. And, and so uh, you've well, written, yeah. I mean, it destroyed my identity. It destroyed my belief system. <clears throat> and I was going to be a lawyer, and I was doing my time in the military, and then to get out and make a lot of money and live, you know, live the dream. So it it was destroyed. Uh, you, and you, that's pretty hard to take. Your last book it's called um, "Please Don't Thank Me for My Service." Tell a little bit about what you saw in Vietnam. <clears throat> I was in the, in the Air Force, so I, I enlisted in the Air Force after being drafted into the Army. I didn't want to be in the Army of the Marines. So I was drafted at the age of 25 out of law school, my fourth semester law school. I was totally for the war. I was very conservative. Uh, I just preferred to be a graduate student than be a soldier. But I, but once I was drafted, I just had to figure a way to have a little bit easier time of it. So I enlisted in the Air Force before my induction date. And so uh, my first two years at headquarters Air Force were, were pretty boring and pretty uh, white collar like. And then I got this assignment uh, to go to Ranger training at Fort Campbell, Kentucky on my way to Vietnam. I didn't even know they had this, this kind of a unit in the Air Force, and I certainly wasn't interested in it, but I got, you know, you're in the military, you follow your orders. I didn't have any great consciousness. I didn't have any deep principles uh, other than finishing law school and making a lot of money. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, when I got to Vietnam after the training at Fort Campbell, I was an, I was head, I was a night security commander at a small air base, 90 miles south of Saigon or uh, Ho Chi Minh City, as it's called today. And for a kind of a peculiar set of reasons, I was asked uh, by a Vietnamese colonel 
who was not in my chain of command, if I would do him a favor and, and um, which I didn't have to do, uh, if I would go, if I would help assess the success of bombing missions of new pilots that had just come in from South Vietnamese pilots had just been trained in Mississippi. Uh, and at first I, I didn't even take it seriously. Well, I was sober. See, most of the officers were drunk a lot and I was sober. I was a night security commander. I was over my head. I was anxious. So I was always studying this, the uh, intelligence reports in the command bunker <laughs> as if that was really going to help me uh, be a better uh, night security commander. It really was just a way of relieving my anxiety. I was a student, you know, I, I was used to reading and underlining and taking notes. And <laughs> uh, so he noticed that I was pretty conscientious and he, he asked me and he said, we really, we're really strapped uh, for troops right now because of what was going on in the Mekong Delta. And I, it's, and it's a safe assignment. You go out in the daytime and you, and you go with a Vietnamese lieutenant and he'll show you where to go. I just need, I need, I need to know from somebody I trust what's happening. I thought it was kind of a crazy idea. Uh, <clears throat> he said that there was, there was a report that some of these uh, new pilots were, uh, were going to sabotage their assignment. Well, I, I wasn't going to do it. But I, uh, this was in April of 69. I was so sick of being around the GIs on the base during the daytime. The diesel fumes were very strong. Planes and helicopters coming in and taking off every minute. Uh, <clears throat> and, well, I just didn't enjoy life with the other GIs. So I frequently went into Canto City. Uh, just to hang out during the daytime. Well, so this was going to be a daytime assignment. So I decided to do it because I was, he thought I was a conscientious, diligent officer. <laughs> I wish I was only because I was anxious. I wasn't, I, I wasn't, by that time, I'd already seen pallets of body bags and I wasn't too excited about anything about loyalty, but I, I, you know, I was somewhat conscientious. So to make a long story short, in one week, from April 14th to April 18th, I think it was, I've reconstructed this in my book even. Uh, I, with this other lieutenant, Vietnamese lieutenant who spoke perfectly good English, <clears throat> uh, he'd been from a Mandarin family and, and who worked closely with the French before, the French lost in, 19, in uh, 1954. So he was from a wealthy family, but he was in the South Vietnamese army. <clears throat> so in five days, we saw five bombing missions, the after, the after effects of five bombing missions. Well, they were all inhabited, undefended villages. Uh, I hadn't even thought in advance too much about them. what was a military target. And of course, there were no military targets in Vietnam on the Vietnamese side. Uh, everybody was either secretly against us or just trying to play the middle game so that they could survive. So my, the very first village we went, the very first target we went into was a small village in, in Long Bin, um, in Vinh Dong, Vinh Long province. And I was just shocked. I was sick. Um, the first thing I saw was a water buffalo on the side, still alive, it's, you know, bellowing these painful sounds with half its belly gashed and a third of its skull gone. And I threw up. Um, and then as I turned to the left, uh, which was the main part of the the uh, village, there was just a lot of <clears throat> a lot of bodies on the ground. There was still smoke because the bombing had been like an hour earlier. Smoke uh, from the burning, the little houses. And I walked as far as I could walk and um, there was too many bodies. I just couldn't walk. I was just trying to make an assessment of 
what I would, how I would report this scene. Uh, and I was, of course, shocked. And I was really sick to my stomach. But I got as far as I could walk without stepping on bodies. And I looked down at my feet and there was this, this uh, what I think was a young, a young Vietnamese woman. I mean, she was pretty uh, burned by napalm and <clears throat> um, shrapnel wounds. She was holding, she had been holding three children. I assume they were her children. But um, I looked down at her, I don't know, I was just, I was stopped. And I saw <clears throat> her eyes were wide open. And I got, I kind of was, I, I was kind of glued to looking at her eyes. I didn't know if she was alive initially, but, but she wasn't alive. But and with that moment, when I saw her eyes, because her eyelids had been burned by the napalm, so there was no eyelids. <clears throat> and I had a lightning bolt strike me and I said, this, this is, she could be my sister. And I'm 9,000 miles from my village in her village. And that just blew me, that just blew me away. Like, um, and the Vietnamese lieutenant was very happy at the scene because he was, a, you know, he was, a, they were communists in his mind. Everybody, everybody was a communist. <clears throat> and he, uh, he asked me what my problem was because I was, throwing up bile juice, I think. And I said, well, I'm looking at my family. I mean, that just kind of came out of me. I didn't have any politics. It wasn't an intellectual thing. It was a very visceral, it was coming out of my gut. And I, I was crying. And so to him, that was a shameful thing for this officer to be crying and be over this, over these, uh, these dead gooks. And I was just, I went into another world. It was like having an LSD trip and I haven't even had an LSD trip, but that's what people have told me that have had, most of my friends have had LSD trips. <clears throat> Some of them are still doing it. But uh, a, a shrink told me later, he said, well, that was like having an LSD trip. You had an epigenetic change in the brain perceptors. You know, I, I didn't know. I was just, uh, <clears throat> I just know that something had really shaken me up. And I, later that week, each day we went to another target and the, the same scene over and over again. Only I didn't walk, I didn't walk that closely and that deeply into the, into the villa. I didn't need to. I had the census report from 1965 that the U.S. had, had um, conducted on, on Vietnam. So I knew approximately how many people lived in all these different villages. I had the census report with me. Um, <clears throat> so that week, I think I witnessed somewhere between seven and 900 dead Vietnamese, mostly children and the mass majority children and young women and a few old people. But um, I actually was hoping initially that it was a mistake. You know, I was still pretty naive. Well, bad intelligence or uh, drunk pilots or I don't know. I didn't know, but I, you know, I'd been in law school, so I was two thirds away through law school and something about me wanted to get, I wanted to resolve why this is happening. <clears throat> Uh, what, uh, if it's, if it's uh, intelligence that I, I, I need to learn about how the intelligence system works. Uh, probably every village in some way was sympathetic to the VC. Um, and it didn't take much to actually the intelligence, intelligence system was so shitty anyways, uh, because all of us, all of us grew up with white exceptionalism. So we had this biased view of the world, you know, it's a, it's a racist view. We're looking at people that aren't white. Um, so I, um, the end of that week was a Saturday and I said, 
to myself, I'm going to go to our intelligence, our own squadron intelligence office, which is in Tonsonut Air Base in Saigon. My squadron was all over the place in Nicaragua. But we did have an intelligence office in Saigon. So I wanted to go and look at the bombing reports. <clears throat> and so I was meeting with uh, this captain for uh, probably three hours on the Saturday. I just hopped a flight to go to Saigon and I was determined I wanted to get to the bottom of this so I could either commit suicide or <clears throat> uh, feel like I had at least had an understanding of what was going on that made sense. Uh, because killing the, these villagers didn't make any sense to me. Um, to, the, to the Vietnamese lieutenant, it was a victory. So I spent three hours with this captain. We were going over in bombing reports, 7th Air Force bombing reports, and sure enough, they reported that all these, these uh, bombing missions, whether they were by South Vietnamese pilots or U.S. pilots, had killed this many VC, this many VC, this many VC, this many VC. And this captain I was talking to said, you know, we've been perplexed because we get a lot of reports that the bombing missions have destroyed certain VC units. And they had letters and numbers that they'd identified these units. And he said, but we've been finding out that the, the, the units, the VC units that we thought had been destroyed, that unit appeared two or three days later in another location. And I said, well, now you know, now we know what's happening. They're calling, killing all these villagers, VCs, just to get the body counts up. They call them VCs so that they cover their ass. And he was kind of like, holy shit. That's right. And then I knew at least I had a clarity about what was happening. Now, that's not a very nice thing to be able to conclude that it wasn't a mistake. It was intentional. And it was that next week that I was very suicidal. Um, I remember reading an article in the Stars and Stripes newspaper, which is a, which is a military. Actually, it's a pretty good paper that's relatively independent, but it's funded by the Pentagon. I noticed that Trump says it should be defunded now, but I mean, it's ac it was actually a fairly decent paper for, for uh, the GIs. Well, there was an article in, in later in April about a Supreme Court decision that had just come down saying that desecration of the flag was protected free speech. And the case was as I was reading the article, uh, a veteran from Korea, a black veteran, had burned a flag in protest of the Vietnam War, but he was a Korean vet, and he'd been arrested and jailed, and he sued, and he prevailed ultimately in the Supreme Court. And I thought, so the pilots can literally burn people alive with napalm and be rewarded, and somebody that burns a piece of cloth that's the flag that symbolizes the policy of bombing human beings is jailed. So if you burn a human being, you get commended. If you burn a symbol that represents that policy, you go to prison. And that was the mind fuck for me. It's like, whoa. And uh, I, I know I had my pistol on my head for uh, a few minutes uh, at one point, my own pistol. Uh, and I'm shaking and crying. Um, so, well, I didn't pull the trigger. And um, I became a student at that point. First, first time in my life, I was a serious student. I got to know about history. Holy shit. Uh, it was all a piece of cake. Um, so I was able to get through that assignment. Um, I was sent home early actually because I spoke out against the war after that every day to my superiors. Um, I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything. I was just saying, look, this is illegal, unconscionable violation of international law, violation of the constitution, the United Nations charter. And of course they didn't like that. 
but I was doing my job. I was a nice security commander. I didn't want to die. I, you know, uh, we were attacked a few times. You got to be kind of alert all the time at night. So that, that was what changed my life. That was an epiphany. Um, there's no way I could go back. I didn't even want to have it. You know, it was going to fuck up my life um, at, the, at that moment. Uh, but I have to say, I'm very fortunate that it happened. Uh, it woke me up and I, there's no way I can, there's no way I can go back. Sometimes I, I, um, you know, fiddle, fiddle around a little bit, wondering what am I going to do next and uh, don't do much of anything for a while. But <clears throat> it's just a, it's a, a visceral belly brain um, understanding. It, was, it wasn't intellectual. It wasn't, it wasn't particularly cognitive. You know, I have to cognitively and intellectually integrate it and looking at the whole world and realize, holy shit, we did this to the Indians, we did it to the blacks. We, this is all we've ever done. And we call ourselves exceptional. So I, even in Vietnam, I was calling myself uh, an ideological robot. I would joke with other soldiers. And I'm an ideological robot. Like, this, is, this is crazy. Yeah. that a grown man would obey, obey an order to do this, but here I am, mm -hmm. you know? So that set the pace or set the foundation for the rest of my life. Yeah, and it, it took you a while to actually get it together, you know, like the shock of this and everything. And yeah. so, but then- uh, I didn't talk about it for 12 years. <laughs> yeah, and you became uh, an activist. Yeah, and so I was, yeah, uh, in the seventies, I was an activist on justice and prison issues, not on foreign policy. Then, about nineteen eighty, I, I was in, I was expanding my understanding of U.S. empire from domestic to global. Even though you'd think I would have started with the global, but I was uh, I had a master's in criminology, and I when I uh, when I got out of the military, I finished law school, so I. Passed the bar exam. I wasn't a particularly great student, but I did pass the bar exam. So there I was, a lawyer, <clears throat> which is what I had thought I wanted to be. But, uh, you know, at the time I was very embarrassed. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, comply with the protocol of the court, which is very simple. <clears throat> you stand up when the judge walks in. And you have to look at that fucking flag up there, <clears throat> which I just couldn't stand it. You know, I used to carry the flag in my little small town parades and <clears throat> it became a swastika in my mind. I didn't talk about that either for many years. I was like, I didn't want to be ostracized. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have anybody to really talk to to share this perspective, but I, w I was with liberal people in the seventies, you know, they hadn't been in, they hadn't been in the military. Um, so I was, I was doing okay. Uh, kind of keeping the secret inside of me. And then I had a flashback in 1981 and then it all, it all came out. <clears throat> I, and I, I had to start talking about it. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> This, that was 12 led years you, this led you into like the CISPs, right? What's that? Uh, you got into CISPs, you know, protesting the war in El Yeah, yes, the Central American wars, Reagan's wars. Uh, I wasn't in, I wasn't particularly a member of any group, but I was supporting CISPs, and then there was NISCBA, which was relating to Guatemala. And there was a Nicaragua network, Nicaragua. And um, <clears throat> so I was just in general, uh, by that time, opposed to everything the United States was doing anywhere in the world, because I knew it didn't have good motives. Um, and, and we didn't have good motives from our founding. You know, we, we killed the Indians, stole their land, killed the blacks, st stole their labor, and called ourselves exceptional. Wow, what a, what a fairy tale. And well, that is what this nation is dealing with right now. Yeah, and, uh, there, there's all these protesters um, out there, like what's going on in Portland, you know, the, uh, the federal troops that were sent in there by uh, Trump, 
shot this one guy with a projectile, uh, fractured his skull. Yeah. Another lady I was looking at yesterday, this happened in Seattle. Uh, she was just standing out there like this, and they shot her in the chest with an explosive uh, uh, flashbang grenade. And uh, then they, people rushed in there, medics rushed in there. They were shooting at the medics, and you know, then uh, her heart stopped three times. And uh, they had to take her to the hospital. You know, it's like the cops or anybody, they wouldn't let anybody in there to, to, uh, to get her. But all kinds of things like this. But you paid a much more dear price than even that, which is the subject of your book before that, Blood on the Tracks, right? Yeah, of course, I didn't, I didn't uh, think I would be run over by that. I was expecting to do a year in prison, but, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't. In fact, I don't have any memory of being hit by the train. You know, I suffered a pretty severe fractured skull and the destruction of my right frontal lobe. Hey. Uh, but in the hospital, it was about the third day when I was kind of awake and, um, my partner at the time who was in the, in the room and friends that were visiting me when I was able to visit, they were telling me what happened and I couldn't believe it. I had no memory of it. And I still don't have any memory of it. It's like, they wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, I was a, I was a security commander of bases in the military. You would never run a munitions train over any obstacle on the tracks, whether it was a cow, a car, a person could have a, a satchel charge strapped to my chest. Um, well, you know, this, uh, let people know that you were block blocking weapons shipments. This was in San Diego, right? No, it was in, um, it was uh, east of San Francisco. Oh. But in you were blocking country, California. The shipments of weapons to El Salvador. Right. And some of those weapons were going to Nicaragua, but they were going through Salvador to Nick. Well, they were going to Salvador and then they were flying, dropping them in from airplanes over Nicaragua. Yeah. You know, it's all everything's so demonic. I mean, it's like, what do you do? Okay, I'm just gonna fast on the tracks and force them to take me to jail. I mean, you know, what else am I going to do, you know? But, but Read comic this, books or... Uh, this engineer know. ran over you on purpose. Yeah, he was ordered to. Well, he was ordered not to stop. And he was speeding three times the speed limit. So he was, the speed limit was five miles an hour and he was going 17 miles an hour and still accelerating. I mean, it, it was uh, an intentional act. Uh, you know, then I found out 18 days later when I was in the hospital that I had been on the t domestic terrorist list. I said, what? You know, it, it just goes on and on. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's so crazy. It, it, it's like, it's hard to believe it. You know, especially, especially if you're a, a white American and, 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 and you know that you're superior to other people. Oh, okay. Um, it's just, well, I think the nation now, they either have a revolution or they're going to be, <clears throat> they're going to be serfs. Um, and well, there's people using the F word, the fascist word now, you know, just yeah. the mainstream media is even saying it. Well, that's true. You know, it started with Reagan and really escalated with Clinton and further escalated with Bush and Obama. <clears throat> <clears throat> didn't, didn't, Trump didn't create it. He's just, he's just, his, his, his gift, if you will, is he has unmasked the entire bullshit scenario of America. Yeah. It's unmasked. Uh, I mean, in a way it's, it's, it's a, it's a gift, uh, in a strange, strange way. I mean, it's, uh, can you see it now, folks? Can you see how, what a f***ing bullshit society this has been all along? Uh, but there's, he's got these hardcore disciples, some of whom were my friends when I was a kid. And uh, they're all well-armed. They, um, they're fanatics. They, they, they're, they're protecting their white identity because it's crashing. Yeah. Here, and I know what it's like from Vietnam when, when I realized my identity 
was no longer valid. Oh my God. But they don't have anything else other than their notion of being a good white boy. Um, their identity is wrapped up totally in that paradigm. And so they're dangerous. Yeah, they are. Very dangerous. And, uh, and you put them together with these, with the federal thugs, uh, and, and you have these uh, armed disciples of Trump. Uh, to have a nonviolent revolution, you really got to have a disciplined, organized, very strategic, uh, and the people in solidarity with each other all over the country and the world. I mean, but I think that's the only option to being a, a serf. Yeah. So the question is whether whether something is going to happen in the collective consciousness that recognizes, holy shit, if we don't do this, we're we're fucked. Yeah. Really fucked. Yeah. And uh, you know, so this is something I just wrote uh, on your uh, yeah, a thing you posted. I said. The only possible good thing that come from Trump, that could come from Trump, is if he is so bad that it kicks off the long needed revolution. Doubtful if Clinton could have caused that. I predicted that he wouldn't survive a full term, which would have been true if the system wouldn't have been massively more corrupt than I thought. <laughs> and uh, bringing the feds is already causing a backlash what needs to happen now is that hundreds of thousands of people need to turn out. And, uh, you know, already in Portland, you can see like there's, the people are already so angry that the feds yeah. are there. And then they got the uh, line of the mothers and all that stuff. And, and now the father, asked, the fathers tonight were, and last night had the, had the leaf blowers. Yeah. I and, don't know if they work with the, with the gas, but you know, the idea was to blow the gas back to the, to the police. Um, when I lived in Port, I still have a house I co-own in Portland <clears throat> and lived there for 10 years. And my good friend, Mike Hasty, who's been doc, he's a, he's a Vietnam vet. He's been a, he's a photojournalist. He's been, I, I posted a couple of his photos and his uh, commentary from the last couple of nights, pretty, in, pretty intense. Um, but if they kill, if anybody gets killed, Instead of having two or three thousand people, they're going to have fifty thousand people. Yeah, and I mean, Trump Portland is not a place that is this that is is a vacuum of activists. It has a lot of activists, and even people who aren't on the streets, they they're politically you know upset. Yeah, and so you kill if one person gets killed. Um, It'll be quite a standoff between thousands and thousands and th and actually, I have messages from people that are driving to to Portland from the East Coast to be yeah. part of it. That's like the uh, uh, the uh, pipeline protests. You know, people came here from here from Seattle yeah. and all over the place. But uh, yeah, like Portland is probably the most progressive city. Like they they are the most advanced as far as like you know making it. Uh, um, uh, uh, they've been working on this program that's addressing climate change yeah. and, and all that stuff for like 20 years. Yeah. They didn't even tell anybody that that's what they were doing, <laughs> but that's what they were doing. And they have the best uh, transit system and uh, all, all, all these uh, other. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a progressive <laughs> city. It's a very white city. Um, so it's the whitest city in the United States in the category of larger cities yeah and it was a, you know oregon was a, a when it was admitted as a state in the 1850s in the constitution it prohibited blacks from even being in the state yeah that's right it is that's why there's there's not as many but the thing is that they're all in sympathy and that's yeah yes well now the whites now we have to bring in the indigenous because they're they've been persecuted even worse than the blacks yeah so we have to we have to have a real uh, confluence of whites, blacks, and Indians who uh, who are in solidarity with each other against the government, and they're going to have to face guns, and that's where, and I know there's going to be people that want to shoot back. There's a natural inclination. I'm, you know, I studied I've studied nonviolence a lot, and when I've been in different tense situations, I had to really resort to my training 
to restrain myself because I knew that if I reacted the way they would like me to react, it was just, it was going to blow things up even worse. So it's going to be interesting. I'm 79 now. I'm just kind of, my wish is that there'll be a revolution that overthrows the government before I die. But uh, it's, if there is, uh, if this, if this develops into a long-term revolutionary process, it might take, you know, I mean, it's, 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 Trump is not going to allow an election. I'm pretty sure of that. You know, he's, he knows he's going to lose. So he's not going to allow an election. So he's, he's doing his final, this is his final game plan, a coup. And he's got the disciples with the guns, plus his own federal agents. So the people really have to be really together. Yeah. And, and it, the stakes are high, their, their, their future, their dignity, it's at stake. So I'm hoping they'll realize how important it is now to really, really be disciplined, organized, strategic, and be in solidarity with people all over the country and all over the world. And because this, it could be like another 1968, where there's, it's a collective energy that, that captures people. And, um, I think Trump is, you know, if any, if nothing else, he might be the person that sparks it. I mean, he's such a provocative asshole. Uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a creepy guy, but he, he, he's a megalomaniac and he'd love to be a dictator. Yeah. And um, I haven't heard too much of the press saying that this is a fascist coup, but I've started using the term fascist coup um, and, uh, you know, the, the press is pretty bad, as you know, um, and they're terrible in Nicaragua. Everything that comes out of mainstream media about Nicaragua is just totally demonizing Nicaragua. It's the most progressive country in Central America. I mean, it's, it's amazing how progressive it is. And that's, of course, why the U.S. is putting so much money in to destroy it. Yeah. And uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, I, uh, the reason why I've been doing this uh, television show for the last 24 years <laughs> is uh, I just uh, got fed up. Now, I knew all, all the stuff that you're talking about, and I went through the epiphany and stuff, you know, in the you know, 70s and everything. It was from reading Noam Chomsky. <laughs> and yeah. I, I read that uh, first book that uh, Chomsky and Herman wrote, and it, it's, it was the... Uh, the double one that they wrote, and by the time I got done reading that, I was depressed for a whole year. <laughs> and, That's and part of the process. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, really, it was the Vietnam vets, the Vietnam vets against the war, and the uh, veterans for peace and stuff that radicalized me the most. They, have, a, they have the visceral knowledge. It's yeah. not not just in the head; it's in the body. Right. And so as one of my friends, uh, John Seabeth, you know, he, he got shot. He talked through a tra tracheotomy tube and uh, uh, he gave me that book. And I was already going to the anti-war demonstrations when I was in high school. Right. We would take off from high school and go downtown and all that. But I, I really started getting my education when I started talking to the vets. Yeah. When I started reading Chomsky. And, what year were you born? I was born in 1952. Okay. So I was facing the last draft, right? And so I was going to leave the country, but I lucked out and I just got the high draft number. You see, I was pre-lottery. I was uh, in, I was in the old the older conscription uh, system. Yeah. And so let me uh, read something you wrote here about what we were just talking about. It says. Little has changed because there has been no popular revolution. In other words, you were talking about the reforms that uh, FDR created yeah. which saved capitalism, right? right. Yeah. But well, they had, actually, uh, it didn't save it. The war, World War II's uh, spending is what saved it. But yeah, it was an effort to save capitalism. Yeah, and and uh, they brought about the New Deal because. They had well organized socialist parties, two of them. Communist Party, Socialist Party, CIO, Labor. Yeah. That's right. And they just went to Roosevelt and said, We want a revolution. 
And he says, well, I don't know if we can give you a revolution, but we'll give you the new deal, and, you know, and so, but at any rate, this, this is what you wrote, said, uh, little has changed because there's been no popular revolution. The 30s were a dynamic period with strong labor unions, a strong socialist party and communist party, which is what provoked the New Deal, which in fact was an effort to save capitalism, which it failed at. But World War II spending brought the US out of the depression. But dysfunctional and unfair capitalism remained intact. The USA has always been an oligarchy, never a democracy, but its secret to success has been systematic exploitation of uh, the poor blacks, minorities, immigrants, ec ecosystem, and others, all under cover of white exceptionalism. It has all been exposed now for 400 years of pretend. So it seems now that it is either fascism or nonviolent revolution or possible extinction or near so. The survival choice is to participate in a popular revolution across the landscape of the USA but because of the intense fear of white privilege being lost, there will be violence that must be confronted with strategic, vigilant, disciplined organizing. And, and so I was saying that <laughs> my main beef is the media, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I know all about the propaganda and, the, uh, you know, I learned that from uh, reading this book that you reminded me of, or that I asked, I had forgotten the guy that wrote, wrote this book. Yeah, Donald Duncan. Yeah, Donald Duncan. Donald Duncan. And I read the, in there about the whole history of Vietnam, the US involvement in Vietnam and uh, Ho Chi Minh, how he was our ally in World War II and they defeated the Japanese and how he was tight with G General Chenault, you know, and had a pistol from General Chenault, which is why, you know, he had so much prestige and all that, and how that, uh, uh, you know, after the French lost, they had uh, planned to have an election, which Eisenhower refused to have, right? right? So, yeah, so uh, that was never in any media, right? right. That, I didn't know about it until I got to Vietnam, and I was reading about it in Vietnam. I said, holy cow. We, we, uh, we, we prevented that election that was called for in the peace accord. It was supposed to happen in July of 1956. And that's, that, reading that, after I'd been in the villages, I was just, I was, uh, well, I was going crazy. But I had an NCO who was very sympathetic with me, even though he was for the war. He was, he was very tolerant of his lieutenant who was, just so angry. He hated Nixon too. So we talked about how much we hated Nixon. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's when I first started to get a clue, right? But yeah. it wasn't until I started reading Chomsky that I really got it. Well, he puts because, it together intellectually, so you really connect all the dots and yeah, and, yeah. and manufacturing consent. You know, and he lays it all out, right? The mainstream media doesn't usually just make up total black propaganda, right? And black propaganda means stuff that's made up out of thin air, right? Usually the way that they mislead you, and they have a number of strategies, but mostly it's just by leaving the most important thing out. Right. Yeah. No context. Yeah. And the most important thing is that the United States invaded Vietnam, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, but to see, Fox News does do that stuff. But they are also clever. They usually don't make up stuff. And I, I had this guy here, Ari Robin Hobbit, and he's talking about, you know, how Fox News pays people, right? They yeah. pay people to make this stuff up that way that they can't be blamed for just making up disinformation, right? But, but the um, American media uh, doesn't usually just make it up, but they do. Like if, if the administration wants to have a war, well, then they all pile on, right? So, you know, then that just gives the game away there. But still, maybe they're not making this up, but they're just not challenging with the administration and the well, team. Because they're all the products of white white supremacy. It's affected it's affected everything about our conditioning. Everything. Hollywood, Boy Scouts, school, politics, everything has been everything has been distorted, terribly distorted. 
So you have to, you kind of, you kind of believe in, you kind of believe in the, the superiority of the United States. Yeah. It, it, it's just, just, it's implicit. Yeah. And it's conditioned in, you don't think about it. You know? That's exactly right. Like you wouldn't know the difference. It's a, you're a frog in a well. <laughs> It takes forever to, to learn that there's a whole world outside of that world. Right. right. And at any rate, so, um, but there is one instance when, you know, the, the uh, mainstream media does put up flat ass lies. And that's the instant it crosses the border. If you've spent all this time going to all of these different countries to investigate. Uh, U.S. imperialism and foreign policy, right? And yeah. so, uh, and you're uh, living in Nicaragua now. Right. And, and so, um, and that was one of the things that we were talking about is that the whole propaganda barrage that they're doing, that they're getting away with. It's, it's Nicaragua and it's Venezuela. They got everybody convinced <clears throat> that Venezuela is a dictatorship. Yeah. When the guy was Cuba. Uh, right, uh, uh, tyranny, tyranny, the choice of tyranny. Yeah, so I was hoping to get you to talk a little bit about that, you know, um, especially being there and seeing it for yourself and living in it. You know. Well, I've been coming to Nicaragua since uh off and on since 1986. So I I was in the war zones a lot, 86, 87, 88, 89, and early 90 when the Reagan's Contra War. So I was, uh, you know, I was um, pretty taken by the culture and their uh, revolutionary spirit uh, against all odds, um, you know, uh, and, and, um, an embargo, terrorists roaming around the country, shooting up villages, uh, blocked from getting any international loans, I mean, you know, they had, it was a <clears throat> real David versus Goliath. And of course they, they lost the election in 1990, but only because Bush said that if they didn't vote for our candidate, we, we created this candidate, Violeta Shimoro, who was a Nicaraguan, but we funded her. And we, we identified her and funded her, created a party called UNO, uh, and told the Nicaraguans if they didn't vote for the U.S. candidate, there would be more war. You know, and there'd been 10 years of war. Every family had lost somebody. Every family at least had lost a leg, if not a, a whole son. Um, and that's, that's all after the War of Liberation, where they lost. I'm not sure how many were lost uh, between 77, 78, 79, probably at least 50 or 60,000 in yeah. those three years. And then they lost another 30, 40,000 during the eighties, during the war against Reagan's countries. And so, so they were exhausted. I mean, you know, they didn't want more war. So that they got 16 years of US neoliberal governments, which of course the US loved. And then uh, the Santa Anise. They were embargoing them, right? And so, so that kind of forced them you know, uh, the Nicaraguan people into realizing they had no way out and they might have- A gun pointed, that's right. They had, they had a gun pointed at their heads. Yeah. So, but the Sandinistas didn't just go away and disappear. So they kept organizing and, and being active in Nicaragua. And they won in 2007, 2006 election, and they took power in 2007. And so all the gains of the revolution of the 80s had been wiped out by the neoliberal governments from 1990 to 2006. But now, uh, despite the U.S. opposition, 300, at least $300 million has been devoted to overthrowing the Sandinista government. I've got it all from the cables, from cable gates, from uh, uh, Snowden. I mean, from, um, yeah, Snowden and WikiLeaks. Um, uh, so that now they have, you know, free education, free health care, the best road system in, in Central America, maybe in Latin America. 98% uh, of the country is elect has elect uninterrupted electricity. Um, they've got um, zero interest loans for, for women. I think there's at least 
uh, half a million women that now have zero interest loans so they can do their own businesses. <clears throat> um, I mean, it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing place. They reduced poverty by, I forgot, a, a large percentage of reduced poverty because it's a government <clears throat> that believes in the well-being of its people. Oh, what a concept. Uh, it does, and, and there's certainly privatization here, but there's a mix of privatization, co-ops, <clears throat> and <clears throat> lots of government programs and subsidies, like subsidies for buses. So everybody, everybody can afford a bus to go any place in the country. You know, it, it's very cheap. Electricity is is sub is uh, su subsidized. Um, Foods or certain foods are subsidized so that everybody has food. And 90% of the country's food is grown, that's eaten, is grown in Nicaragua. So that's a big plus when you're talking about dealing with the big giants because you have a little bit more freedom to say, F you, um, because people aren't going to starve. And, but there's still a lot of poverty here and there's still a lot of problems. But I, I know the neoliberal government, it would have been, you know, there wouldn't be any healthcare education, no subsidies. And um, I'm just hoping that the U.S. doesn't succeed in overthrowing the government. But, you know, I'm going to I'm going to stand here and be as much of an op opponent as I can. Um, I mean, at my age now, I, I'm recovering from a surgery two years ago it's actually been a successful surgery but i have when the pandemic came i hardly leave my house i you know i have a big house here so i walk around the house i do my rowing I have a rowing machine and I have a little pool i can go in the water um but <clears throat> i i'm in i'm in suspense about what's going to happen in the u.s so i constantly am uh you know looking on the on on facebook and the news i'm just so hoping that that the people will stay in the streets I'm in suspense about what's going to happen in the U.S. So I constantly am, uh, you know, looking on the on on Facebook and the news. I'm just so hoping that that the people will stay in the streets and not because it's. The, I mean, the system's very resilient. Yeah. Um, but human beings have been around a lot longer than the systems have been around. So. Uh, the question is whether this is a, a moment where um, the, the collective emotional energy kind of rushes to the forefront because it's necessary to survive. You don't even have to, you don't necessarily even have to articulate it. It's, it's something that's happened throughout history. There are these moments when, when, it's, when it's ripe. And this is definitely a ripe time for a revolution in the United States with the pandemic, the unemployment, the bankruptcies, um, the uh, police brutality, the, the, the heightened sensitivity of many people now about the history of the U.S. And then Trump, who's was like a, like a trigger. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not going to count on it, but I'm really... I'm really I'm almost like if I was praying, believing in prayer, then please, um, young people and other people, just don't give up because your future is it really is at stake. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, I mean I know a lot of people are thinking this way. So the question is whether they can be 
they need they need tenacity and and they need to be able to put up with a lot of bullshit. Yeah. Well, what, uh, what makes me feel good is that you know um, uh, when uh, Trump had the uh, immigrant ba or the uh, the ban, you know. Yeah. And then uh, all those people just spontaneously showed up out in the streets and they shut down the air traffic system of the United States, you know, and they weren't organized or anything. They just showed up. And I think that what's going to happen now, what I'm hoping now is because that Trump, you know, has, he might have an alligator by the tail, you know, because by sending the feds to all these cities, they, which are, all the cities are democratic, right? <laughs> No, I don't think there's any he cities. Identified. That... He explicitly says he's going to send them to the cities with the Democratic mayors. Yeah, that uh, people will just explode out there. Hundred, hundreds of thousands of people getting out there, and uh, none of them are working. Not, I mean, people aren't working or anything. So what else are they going to do? And, exactly. Uh, they're, being, they're losing their housing. They're, I mean, it's it's like that's another part of the confluence. There's going to be more people that are sitting around with nothing to do. Yeah. And, and uh, I think maybe this is part of the system that I'm, I'm a victim of the system. Uh, no work, no future. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty ripe moment. Uh huh. So uh, that's one thing that makes me hopeful. Yeah. Same here. And I just hope, I hope before I die that uh, I can actually see it happening or feel it happening. Uh, and actually I'm pretty excited just to, you know, just knowing how many people are on the streets in Portland right now. And actually, there's people in streets all over. The, there's, there's still Black Lives Matter actions happening every day in many parts of the United States. It's just not in, so much in the news now. But I was looking at the list last night of many of the cities. that uh, I was looking at um, RT, I think. Uh, I can't get RT here in English, uh, so I get it on YouTube. But RT is a pretty good, pretty good news. Yeah, not better than CNN, which is what. Which I'm, I'm I'm producing for Free Speech TV. Right? You what? Oh yeah, I would love to be on Free Speech TV. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> no, you are. But you know the thing is, you know I uh, no, but... went up to Canada to see one of my friends up there, an old guitar player that I knew for ever since the '70s. And he was always begging me to come up there, so I seemed like I was halfway to the North Pole. Went up there, and he, they don't get free speech TV, but they do get RT. And he would just watch that nonstop, you know. I think I, 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 I had it here for a while, and I, that's all I watched. Um, but now I don't have it. So, I, I mean, I, I had it on uh, my cable, but I don't have it now, so I can get it on YouTube. Um, yeah, RT, RT is. It's about as good as you're going to get in the, in the news business these days. I mean, all the others are totally corporate. Um, uh, really, it's it is pathetic, as you know. I mean, you, the media is just it's just a cabal. I mean, uh, when when Bernstein wrote that uh, that article in Ramparts in two in 1977, that was a incredible. Um, Document documented CIA yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. control of the media all over the world. Yeah, uh, how they did that, and then of course Doug Valentine talks a lot about it in his latest book too. You know Doug Valentine, uh, yeah, the CIA. The so that was all exposed by the uh, church and uh, yeah. right. periods, and then so you know this is another thing when you study the media, you realize that every once in a while. <laughs> this window opens up right that they start talking about all this stuff that they could never touch before right and they didn't have any choice you know the the new york times wrote this big mea culpa right three three days in a row you know exposing all of their past associations with the cia you know and uh, so the whole thing was exposed and then uh, all the window shut and then it was all over again, right? But of course, you know, it's, it's all the same. You know, I mean, the CIA, the uh, PR companies, the Fox News, I mean, what's the difference? Yeah, it's a big cabal of, of, of corporate fascism. I mean, it's a, 
it's it, it's just it just all works together to maintain the status quo and the, and the and the basic line of America the greatest or I mean they're just so trying so hard to create Russia as an as the enemy I mean they've they've tried with the Russia gate they tried with the uh, bounty story and now with the with the vaccine story I mean they're they're um, I have friends that live in the Soviet Union and we communicate all the time and, and, and they're all from the United States, but they say, wow, it's so great being in Russia compared wow. to the United States. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and I have one that lives in Ukraine, who lives in um, Kiev, or no, not Kiev, uh, Yalta. And he just, he's 75. And um, he said, it's really a phenomenal place. Yeah. But you'd never know it if you, uh, unless you were there, unless you experienced it. That's see, that's from my Vietnam experience. I knew that I had to go places to see for myself, because my energies comes from my gut. I, I mean, I have to, I have to feel things. Now I can read about them, but I have to feel it from what I call visceral visceral interactions. And um, I think that's the key. If you if you feel the fire in the belly, you're gonna. That's an energy that you can't just suppress. You can you can have an idea in your head, say that's really bad. But unless you have a a, a pain in the belly, you you're not gonna you're not likely to do so much about it. Yeah, I mean, that's just a basic. Um, that's just a basic principle. Um, and you you did read Bonhoeffer. You've got his book, right? Yeah. So you you got it. <laughs> well, I, uh, I found it on the internet, so I started digging, and then I was reading something, and then it said source. <laughs> so I clicked on the source, and I found the whole book as a PDF. And so I read that chapter, you know. On stupidity. Uh, oh, there's on, there's another there's a couple chapters. Yeah. In there. On stupidity. on stupidity, yeah. Because I had to read that whole thing, and uh, and uh, we were talking about this, and the thing is that that's before cognitive scientists really understood, you know, uh, all this stuff like cognitive bias and all these things that are actually programmed into us by evolution, right? Yeah. But, uh, they know a lot more now about uh, human cognitions, cognitive psychology. But the thing is, this guy was really smart. And the thing is, he saw it going on with the, the, pro, the propaganda that the Nazis was, were using, which they got from Edward Bernays. Right. They stole they got, it from the United they States. They the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> and, and everything. But he figured it out. Uh, let's just say what that is. That's, that's uh, what's the name? Say that guy's name again and the name of the book. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yeah. Letters and letters and papers from prison. He yeah. wrote it while he was in prison before he was before he was hung. And then uh, later, people found his notes and published it posthumously. I think it was published in the early fifties, maybe. Yeah. Um, and he tied it all together, you know, like uh, propaganda and indoctrination, you know, and, and feelings. You see. You, you, the, the Germans were depressed because of the Versailles Treaty, which tr truly unfairly treated the Germans. And then there was the economic depression. And Germans felt that they'd been a superior people. And all of a sudden, nothing was working. And um, so uh, a savior came along, like Trump, you know, uh, that. As as uh, I love the uh, I love uh, Bonhoeffer's statement that stupidity is a more dangerous enemy of the good than malice, because you're not you're not uh, you're not you're not being evil. You're you're uh, you you know it. You you you. It's it's. It, there's no debate. Yeah, let me read you that. You can't discuss it with them. That's my, my early friends who are now Trump supporters. They were my best friends when I was a kid. I can't talk to them. And yet we, we had wonderful times when we were 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And now they're all heavily armed. And oh, it's like, 
I wonder if they'd shoot me if they, if we were in the same room. Here, look at it. Just let me read what, what this paragraph says. This is too good. It says, folly is a more dangerous enemy to the good than evil. One can protest against evil. It can be unmasked and if need be prevented by force. Evil always carries the seeds of its own destruction and it makes people at the least uncomfortable. Against folly, we have no defense. Neither protest or force can touch it. Reasoning right. is of no use. Facts that contradict personal prejudices can simply be disbelieved. Indeed, the fool can counter by criticizing the facts. And if they are undeni undeniable, they can just be pushed aside as trivial exceptions. So the fool, as distinct from the scoundrel, is completely self-satisfied. In fact, he can easily become dangerous as it does not take that much to make him aggressive. A fool must therefore be treated more cautiously than a scoundrel. Yeah, that's uh, like Trump's shall, disciples. Yeah, we shall never again try to convince a fool by reason, for it is both useless and dangerous. Right. Now there was a psychiatrist named Otto Finichel. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. He was a psychoanalyst. And I, because I, that, you know, I'm, I'm right, trying to write this book about exceptionalism and stupid and how it made us stupid. And I'm using my own life as an example of how stupid I was. Uh, but I was supposed to be a good, you know, intelligent man. But Otto Finichel, Finichel said, he said this in uh, 1945. He said, people become stupid. Uh, when they do not want to understand where understanding would cause anxiety or guilt feelings or would endanger an existing neurotic equilibrium. So anything that disturbs your, like I was disturbed from what happened to me in Vietnam. And I mean, it's, it's pretty awful to, yeah. to know that everything you've been taught is wrong or is suspect or it's, it's like, it's dangerous. It's, you're like a monster. Yeah. Um, so, Trump supporters, they're they're really they're really locked in. Yeah, and there's well, I, probably there's millions of them. Yeah, but they still are a very small minority, you know. Well, I don't think they're small, but I think they probably are maybe thirty million or something like that. I, I, yeah, you know. but they turn out and vote. That's the thing. All yeah, the percent of they people. turn out to shoot. They turn out to vote. Um, they're 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 defending their their um, identity, uh, their fake identity against truth. I mean, it's, it is very painful. Yeah. Well, I better wrap this up, I think. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta go too, so. Well, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, well, let's do it again. I really want okay. to. Okay, be happy to whenever, whenever you want. Okay, thanks a lot, Brian. Okay, thank you. Sure. seems like all I read about is our country at war in another country. And this has been going on for most of my life. So why do these wars continue to be waged in our name? Not long ago, I met a man named Brian Wilson, a Vietnam War veteran who stood up against that war, a war that was also waged against a civilian population with over 5 million lives lost and 58,000 American lives plus hundreds of thousands of others injured. For the past 40 years, Brian has been speaking out against American-backed wars in countries with democratically elected governments all around the world. Perhaps Brian is best remembered by sitting on the tracks in protest the shipment of a munitions train to Central American nations of El Salvador and Nicaragua. Munitions kill people, and we're responsible for it. We're responsible for stopping it. So we can speak our hearts with our bodies on our legs between these rails on that road. Along with others, at a peaceful protest, Brian sat on the tracks on the 1st of September in 1987. But the train had orders from up high not to stop that day. 
and Brian was struck by the speeding train and run over. Wilson is in John Muir Hospital in Walnut Creek. He lost both of his legs last week when he tried to block a munitions train at the Concord Naval Weapons Station. Today he said he'll be back. He lost both his legs and nearly lost his life. But he survived. Not only that, he told people from the hospital to go out in place of him to demonstrate their solidarity and support. And they did. Uh, that's why when I traveled after that, and I would go to different countries and meet with people who were in struggles, they would so dearly embrace me because they knew I was a Yankee that paid the price that they pay all the time for standing up to power. Brian has been uh, one of my, my greatest teachers in this journey because his journey is so intense. He has been in so many places and seen so much suffering and stood in solidarity with people. But what an incredible man. And I've recently read his book, Blood on the Tracks. It's his autobiography, but it's more than just a biography. It's a chronicle of American foreign policy and history. And, you know, he's such a principled man. There needs to be people to set the example that it is possible to have great power to save lives or to save a democracy, to save a constitution. You don't have to pay the price that Brian did, but you can support our documentary. And together, we will make a difference. And I want to mention to everyone that, that Brian recently returned from Vietnam. He went to Vietnam recently as sort of a completion. And maybe, Brian, you could start with that, if you want to, if you want um, Well, I, I'm not sure that I want to start out saying what I saw in Vietnam, but um, I, I never know what I'm going to say when I'm at a microphone. But um, I, this is uh, maybe the eighth or ninth film I've been to. I, don't, I, I really don't watch the films anymore. I mean, it's... Um, a little bit boring, really. Um, but uh, we had our premiere in Portland on July 3rd uh, at the Clinton Street Theater, in which we, we uh, filled the theater and standing room only. And it was the uh, first time I'd seen it on a big screen with uh, the sound system of a, of a theater. And it was so much different than watching it on a television with a DVD player. Um, and, and, uh, and then when we went to Oakland, uh, at the Grand Lake Theater, if anybody's been to the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, it's this beautiful 1924 theater that's just uh, incredible with a huge marquee. And they had even a better sound system and a better screen than I'd seen ever before. And it was amazing how, how, what a different experience it was to see it in that theater. Um, so I'm just getting used to uh, the different the different venues and the different experiences based on the sound and the th and, and I'm not I don't know anything about technical stuff uh, in fact some of the t some of the screenings we've been at uh, we didn't have the right cords and the right machine and it took us like 20 minutes to figure out how to get the uh, get, get the film up um, I will say uh, that I, a little bit about Vietnam I did go to Vietnam in April with Becky organized uh, a, a little delegation with me and two other veterans. And I was, we were there almost a month. And it's the first time I've been back voluntarily since I was involuntarily sent there in 1969. Uh, and it was a, quite an incredible experience. I was kind of shocked that many of the Vietnamese now want to be like U.S. Americans. And uh, they want uh, fast food. They have almost all the fast food joints you can think of here are there. Uh, Starbucks came in uh, the months we were, we were there. Um, 
And, you know, I was kind of depressing. I'm trying to get away from the culture, and I go to Vietnam, and I'm immersed back into the seduction of the U.S. American culture. Um, and uh, I was also shocked that very few young people in Vietnam know anything about the history of the war. And wherever we went, uh, people said, we look to the future, we don't dwell on the past. Which, um, I don't know if, I, I, in my mind, that doesn't work very well for me. But uh, I'm not able to, nor should I judge any, any Vietnamese for how they think and, and how they're living their life. Um, but we saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the thousands and thousands of third generation birth defect children from Agent Orange. There's somewhere between 500 and 600,000. Um, there's 300,000 tons of unexploded ordnance uh, still in the, in the country. And when Obama, Obama I call him, went back to Vietnam in May, um, what did he do? Of course, Vietnam is one of our partners in the Trans-Pacific Partnership in the TPP. Um, and what he did was he lifted the arms embargo so they could start buying jet fighter planes from Lockheed Martin. Uh, no apologies about the unexploded ordinance or uh, for, for uh, 21 million gallons of Agent Orange that was sprayed, uh, or 21 million gallons of herbicides, of which most of that was Agent Orange. Um, and Monsanto has offices now in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh City, one of the manufacturers of Agent Orange. So um, this neoliberal, this neoliberal uh, economic religion uh, is um, pretty much everywhere now on the planet. And that's depressing to me. Um, but the Vietnamese completely welcomed us and they're, it's a very collective society unlike our society. They will become more individualistic as they become more materialistic, but they're a very collective society, very Buddhist. And um, I was able to meet with ex-fighters of the NLF, which we called the VC, and uh, at least five dozen ex-North Vietnamese soldiers, including officers, and the three of us who were veterans we had what we call apology ceremonies. We actually apologized to the Vietnamese for having been on the wrong side. We said that if we had known then what we know now, uh, we would have been fighting against the U.S. I mean, you know, that was kind of how we feel deep down inside of us, even though we likely would not have gone over there um, at the time. But they all clapped and they all appreciated the fact that they knew that we had paid our own price going there working, uh, you know, having been sent there by our government. And they appreciated the fact that ex-U.S. fighters would go back and talk to them and say, we're really sorry that we participated in destroying 13,000 of your 21,000 villages and killed five to six million of, of your residents and your citizens. I mean, it's, it's not even graspable what we did to the Vietnamese. It's not graspable what we did to the Native Americans over the last 500 years. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's uh, coming, to, coming to grips uh, as the Mother Earth is now has a fever, you know. She, the fever is in response to the infection of us burning carbon. We burn carbon from the moment we get up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night. It fuels our whole lives all day long and cools or heats our house all night long while we're sleeping. And the earth is, is responding now in a way that we can't ignore. And um, the warming, I think of as, as a fever. Um, and we, as a species, could join her immune system uh, by re uh, undergoing a radicalization of our own consciousness. Because nature does bat last, and uh, we will not prevail with our arrogant um, sense of our exceptionalism, 
um, our sense of superiority. And when we were having conversations with the Vietnamese, we would talk about these kinds of things. But I think they were down for so long, and they were so, um, we, had, we had done such a good job of destroying their ecology and their, and their village culture. Um, and we had an embargo on them from seven, 1975 to 1994, the strictest embargo, even more strict than against Cuba. Um, you know, now they they want to have their they, they want to have their time, and who I, who am I to to judge them for that? Uh, but I just know that it's it it's kind of to me it's like it's part of this runaway neoliberal economics that uh, captures us all, kind of captures most of the people of the world, and uh, it's based on carbon. It's based on burning carbon, and you look up at the poles in in uh, the, the, the electric poles at every corner in Saigon or in Ho Hanoi or in Da Nang or Hawaii, you see thousands of wires at the top of that pole. You, you can just see how this is all going to collapse at some point. We're just more and more wires, more and more electrons because all of this neoliberal modernism is built on electricity that's generated by burning uh, some kind of a fossil fuel or processed uranium. So it was an eye-opening experience um, just to, and I went back to the base I was at um, where I was the night security commander in 1969, and it's not there, you know? Uh, but, but what is there is the Cantu International Airport with the same runway configuration when I was there. Um, when we when we were protecting that runway, uh, but it's a very modern building, and so for the Vietnamese, it's a wonderful thing that they they can modernize like this. Um, but I'm still kind of processing what it all means for the world, uh, what the U.S. model means for the world, and how it's impacting the whole world, and how a lot of people now are rising up, and the Standing Rock Sioux rise up is incredibly powerful um, and there's a whole lot of people I think there's a lot of people from Eugene that are there there's a lot of people from Portland that are there um, and so that is very exciting that all through history when people will only stay on bended knee for so long before they rise up I mean it's just it's it's just at some point you no longer accept the repression or the lies or the deceit. And maybe this year's elect presidential campaign, which is a theater of the absurd, like all of our elections are, um, it's such a distraction from more creative revolutionary thinking that we get so caught up in, the, in, the, uh, in this absurdity. And whoever wins, of course, is just a spokesperson for the cabal of the military industrial complex. They're not really uh, able to address the needs of the people. Only we can, in a sense, rise up to do that. Only we as human beings. And, uh, vote for them. We just validate their sense of power by doing that. So, you know, both the political parties are in collapse. Both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are in collapse, and that's great. And um, and the question is, what now? What is what is what are we going? How is this a turning point in in human history? We have um, people all over the world really are beginning to separate themselves from nation states and becoming more self-reliant. The Standing Sioux are a wonderful example of both. Uh, perpetuating a, a traditional way of life and obstructing business as usual. Obstructing business as usual is so important now. Obstructing business as usual as we then regroup as to how are we going to reconfigure our lives locally in a social way that makes sense for us and the environment. Um, Maybe you have some questions or comments or critiques of the film. This is not my film. You have to understand there's a guy named Bo Boudart who made this film. It's not my film. I don't schedule it. I don't sell it. Um, we've been through 
seven drafts together, and I've always critiqued it. I've had issues with every draft. Um, this is the, the final draft, although there's another draft that's uh, 14 minutes shorter than this, but it's basically the same film. Uh, so I'm always interested to know what people think of the film and what and or what they might have to say uh, about the film or or my own participation in the film. I mean, you know, really, the title should be uh, "And Voices from the Peace Movement," and that's another thing I've been discussing with a filmmaker. Should say the story of S. Brian Wilson and Voices from the Peace Movement because it's much broader than about me. Um, so at any rate, if you have issues or questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Since, um, since nothing has really been reformed in terms of the war system in this country, don't you think there's likely to be another major war in five or ten years? What should we do now to stop that from happening five or ten years from now? Well, of course, the... the um, our system, our political economy, is dependent upon wars. It makes that's how it makes its money. It needs wars. It needs to create pretexts for wars, which it does very easily. And we have a dumbed-down population that's so busy paying off their debts and uh, just trying to survive. It's almost like it's hard to have an independent, critical mind. Uh, but there are there are critical minds, and some of them are right here in this room. But um, you know, I think that Hillary Clinton really wants to have a war with Russia. I mean, she's just doing everything to, to taunt uh, the Soviets uh, because uh, of these 30,000 NATO troops right on the Soviet border, uh, which is, you know, when uh, uh, the U.S. had promised Russia that we would not extend NATO to, uh, east towards the Soviet I mean, the Russian border some time ago. I mean, the system thrives on militarism. It thrives on war. It profits immensely on war. So I don't know about five or ten years from now. I just know that we're kind of in an endless war uh, situation, uh, covertly, overtly. And I think the only thing that can stop it is the rising up of the people of the United States. Not the political system, not the election system, but some kind of a historic evolutionary shift in the consciousness that recognizes we've all been duped, we've all been validating a system that is not, does not serve us. We've, been addic we've become addicted like I have to a way of life that requires carbon and a lot of cash and we need to figure out how to replace community, how to replace money with community. And, um, and that is a, I don't know if you can, you can quite organize it, but there comes a, mom, a ripe moment in history when things happen because they're ripe. Like Occupy in 2011. Occupy. That was not planned. It was, it was a spontaneous 2,700 camps in the U.S., all starting in late September going until they were evicted in mid-November. But that was a reflection of, of, of some kind of a reservoir of anger uh, because the system is not responding to the, to the needs of the earth or the people. So I think I'm... I know we're capable, we're capable of a rising up, which means going outside any envelope that we've been in so far, because our survival requires it. Whether we will or not, I don't know. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I just know that uh, we are totally capable of radical shifts in the way we think and live, and at this point in history, it's indispensable if we want to survive, even with fewer numbers, because the Earth is going to dwindle our numbers. We're already, the Earth is finite, and we're already got too many people uh, consuming too much, all of which is, is dependent upon gouging uh, resources out of, the, out of the literal Earth itself and then burning it. 
Um, so it's a, it's a really an interesting time to be alive because we're actually discussing these issues. We're discussing our own imminent extinction and actually having the discussion about it. We are actually discussing this. And that to me is really important, that we're aware that we have been sold a bill of goods and that our participation is what the system needs to survive. And if we stop participating, if we stop, um, if we, if we stop cooperating with the system, it collapses. And the question is, how, how does that manifest? Um, I, you know, I'm reading uh, about the history of the Mayan civilization that collapsed about 900 AD. Um, the Mayan civilization collapsed because, uh, one of the main reasons is because the kings were getting so greedy. Uh, and this is after 2,500 years of a civilization. They were getting so greedy, the workers couldn't, didn't get enough calories to do the work to feed the kings. And so what did they do? They went to the mountains. They abandoned the kings and the kings starved in one generation. So, because they didn't have anybody else to feed them. And that's a model, I think. Abandoning our support of the system, giving us new energy and new imagination to reconfigure ourselves our, we will reconfigure ourselves in hundreds or thousands of local communities, call them bioregions, if you will, with watersheds. Uh, but it's, it's really up to us. It's not up to us looking to the system. The system will not, will not address these issues because they are making money on it and they own the politicians. Really, they own the whole political process. Why are we... Why should we continue to validate them? That would be my question. What, what, it's just because we're, that's what we're used to. We're used to. It's a habit. It's, a, it's our pattern. It's easy, but it's not going to prevail. That system is, I mean, our participation in this system is, we have to recognize that it's complicity in, the, in a pathology. And we're better than that if we can get out of our heads and into our hearts and really grasp that um, we have what we need from an evolutionary perspective to radically change the way we think and live, but it has to be collective. Twenty two. Twenty two. Okay. Yeah. I I don't think that we had that same problem. It occurred to me that possibly when we came back, there was somebody listening to us in some way. It was a lot of the nation. And I'm just wondering if this is you think this is a factor and these guys coming back, they've got nobody to talk to. Well, in 1983 to 85, I was director of a Veterans Outreach Center in Massachusetts. And in that period of time, I know 12 veterans that committed suicide uh, right in my community, Franklin County, Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts. Um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that far more veterans from Vietnam committed suicide than were killed in Vietnam. It would have been more than 58,000 plus. Would have, more than that would have committed suicide. I don't know that it's a recent. Uh, I didn't have anybody to talk to when I came back except Vietnam veterans against the war. And I discovered them by, by kind of by accident. But when I discovered them, it was like mana from heaven. You know, it was like, wow, I don't have to explain anything to these, these people because they know what I'm talking about. I mean, I couldn't talk to my family. I couldn't talk to my high school classmates. Um, they thought, I mean, they, they, were, they just didn't have the, the, the frame of reference of that experience. Um, so I think that war is so, is so pathological. When you go through basic training, they start weaponizing your soul. That's what I say. And they teach you to demonize the enemy. And when you demonize 
uh, a group of people, you dehumanize yourself, and when you dehumanize yourself, you easily can become a monster. And that's what happens. Um, we can so easily, as, as Camila Mejia says, I lost my moral compass. They don't want us to have a moral compass. They, 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 they train us not to have a moral compass so that we can do their bidding and kill. What was I doing in a village 9,000 miles from my own village, as I say in the film? Well, that is, that is totally absurd. I'm in somebody else's village. Uh, they've never been further from their village than maybe 10, 10 kilometers. And I'm 9,000 miles from my village in their village. I mean, there's something, how, 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 easily, how easily we have in patriarchal societies for the last few thousand years, how easily we obey a th vertical authority structures and figures. Um, but it's like, where, what happened to our soul or what happened to our sense of uh, mm, understanding the whole context that we, that we grew up in or, or didn't, weren't taught when we grew up, the context of the history of the world, the history of, the history of indigenous people, the history of, of, uh, of how many, many generations of people were raised where their mother never, where the child is never separate from the mother for two or three years. They're not even in cribs or, or baby carriages. They're on the body of the mother. And that is so important in developing a sense of context with a moral compass. It's not cognitive yet, but it's deeper than that. And I, I just think capitalism is the worst possible system we can possibly um, have and uh, it all the social problems we see are all symptoms of a, of a political economy that, that doesn't care about uh, anything but money. We're afraid to deal with the inconvenient truth of the national security state, which is more powerful than the elected government. I, I come back to my um, premise that we, the people, furnish the political and economic fuel that breeds and, and requires imperial policies because our collective lifestyle is dependent upon burning huge amounts of carbon, uh, which is basically oil, and that we can't separate our lifestyles from the policies. We can say the, the military industrial complex is very evil, the Pentagon maybe the most evil building in the world, uh, but it all, these, all these institutions are creations of human beings. They didn't create, weren't created in a vacuum. And um, so I think I come back to saying we have the power, we have the power to bring down the system and create a new one. And the question is, will we have the imagination and the creative energy to do it especially if we can say we no longer are going to be distracted by the political absurd political system and the election system in the United States, which is really just, to me, a huge distraction from real creative, energetic, vit vital activities, uh, which our future is dependent upon. Uh, another big dumb dad. Back. Uh, what I'm getting more and more disturbed survival is people coming up and saying thank you for your service. It's starting to really draw pain. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I, I'm at the point now where I ask them if they've got three minutes to hear what I have to say after they thank me for my service. Most of the people I knew over there, and I was a diver and EOD person trained by SEALs, most people over there that I knew weren't serving anybody they were trying to stay alive right they were trying not to harm anybody they were trying to recover at night from what they'd done during the day this is not active service for our country this is active coping for yourself so i want to set the record straight with people who have a moment to demythologize their silly comments most of us weren't serving our country we were trying like hell to stay alive. 
Well, I'm just finishing a book with, with Becky, uh, co-written co, uh, with my, uh, my partner, um, called Please Don't Thank Me For My Service. Um, and uh, when I go to the VA, which is my health care system, uh, it seems like almost every time I'm there, when I'm leaving the doctor's office or the nurse's station, they say, oh, by the way, thank you for your service. And I have to stop and say, please don't thank me for my service because it wasn't service. It was disservice to humanity. And uh, it's just a pro-war statement is what it is. It's just keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on thinking the same way so that we can have more and more wars. Uh, it is really, a, I know all my vet friends feel the same way you do. It's so annoying. It's so irritating. It's so... Um, it's so really invalidating because, you know, those of us who are talking about it, are we're truth tellers. We're trying to tell the truth about the war. Thank us for that, maybe, but not for our service. So it's pretty irritating. Um, I uh, can't disagree with you about uh, the election system being a oh, circus. I, I, I just had a comment about That's that good. because of your, the way you were dissing the political uh, I know that I, a lot of people don't agree with my position, so it's, it's good to have a, a good full discussion on it. Uh, things have happened, uh, things have changed since 9-11, too. Uh, the the, the uh, rhetoric in the nation is much more right-wing. I feel like I'm back in the McCarthy era. Uh, I grew up in the McCarthy era. I thought it was a great era, I mean, saving freedom from communism. But when I look back, I realize, oh, holy Toledo, that was really a brainwashing time. Um, but I think uh, there's virtually no independent politicians these days, none, virtually none left. Um, they're all owned by the big money. Uh, virtually all of them are owned. They're, they're dependent upon the uh, big corporations for their campaigns. and. Um, so, uh, and, you know, you could look at Hillary and Trump and say, well, you know, you could almost argue that Trump would be better than Hillary because he might not get bipartisan support in the Congress, whereas Hillary will get bipartisan support in the Congress. I mean, that would be one. I'm not, I'm not advocating voting for them. But uh, you could argue that uh, uh, Hillary will, will have bipartisan support, and we know she's a war, a war hawk. And... Uh, Trump, is, Trump would not have the same kind of bipartisan support. So if there's any semblance of checks and balances, um, you could argue that Trump would be better than Hillary. But I'm not going to argue that any of them are worthwhile. I think, I mean, you know, there's, there's some role in, uh, in, in doing, getting out information if, if you have that position. But the, the President of the United States and the Congress of the United States are not independent entities supporting human rights or the needs of the people. They are supporting a imperial plundering system to maintain 4.6% of the world's population with a third of the world's resources. That's what we are. We are 4.6% of the world's population consuming a third of the world's resources. Now, the only way that can happen is through force or threat of force. And that's why we send in the Marines. And Noam Chomsky calls it the fifth freedom. You know about Roosevelt's four freedoms. Freedom, from, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. The fifth freedom that we really take seriously is if some group or entity or sovereign nation interferes with our ability to get something we want, we send in the Marines. That's the freedom we really protect. The right to plunder and pillage wherever we need to go to maintain our way of life. And the obscene profits for the 1% that comes from this kind of activity. And we wind up giving them our money and our validation and our taxes and our votes. And I'm simply suggesting that at this point in history now, that we are, we've been sold a bill of goods. I know our middle class way of life is very conveniently protected by this system. That's the problem. But it's not going to prevail. Do you have an opinion on, on Jill Stein? 
But I think she's good. I think she's better than uh, any. I mean, she's better than the other candidates. I mean, Bernie never talked about the wars or the or the military-industrial complex. He was good on domestic issues that people well, wanted to hear. And then we have to stack the chairs. Yeah, it's a very simple story. I was on my book tour in 2011 when my book was published, and I was actually in Massachusetts. I was staying at a little cabin in Essex. Uh, while I was traveling around New England, there was a person that said, look, you can stay in this cabin, and you can go to New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Maine from here. And she read the book, and two or three nights, she couldn't put it down. She said, I called a filmmaker friend of mine and told him that he should consider a film about your life. And within a few days, that filmmaker had contacted me. And that was in November of 2011. And he has been working on it ever since until he got a final draft in May, I think it was, of 2016. So almost five years. I mean, and then, uh, of course, I've had many meetings with him over the years, and the, the associate producer, Frank Dorrell in Los Angeles, has had a huge impact on the film. And Susan Utell, who's the editor, a genius at putting the story together. Thank you. So I always remind myself the degree to which I'm just a moment in a tradition, a contingent extension of a heritage. And yes, I do come from a people who have been terrorized for 400 years and yet has taught the world so much about freedom. At our best, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, refused to terrorize those who had terrorized us. And you and I know if the dominant form of black leadership had been won, of counterterrorization against the vicious forms of terrorization coming at us, there would be no America. There would have been civil war every generation. There'd be terrorist cells in every chocolate side of town. But no black versions of the Ku Klux Klan became the dominant form of leadership in terms of wrestling with this question of what does it mean to be human? A lot of times I just go to different contexts and I tell my vanilla brothers and sisters, I say, when you see black people, you ought to just give them a standing ovation. <laughs> just give them a standing ovation. It's true. Thank you for not opting just to terrorize back. Thank you for attempting to ascend to a higher moral and spiritual ground as you had to deal with 244 years of white supremacist slavery where the average slave would be dead at 27 years old torture every day from sun up to sun down and yet there labor would produce the wealth, which is the precondition of the mark of the democracy with the fundamental presupposition and precondition, which is, of course, our precious indigenous brothers and sisters and their land, their children, their women, their men. So let us never, ever say that slavery was America's original sin. That's just a typical neoliberal gesture <laughs> of trying to understand race as simply a democratic deficit 
No, it was the treatment of indigenous people, which is the original sin, which means America begins as empire rather than democratic experiment. So, very important starting point, vantage point to understand how you talk about the constructions of race and how they change over time, the various iterations and elaborations and articulations of this dynamic concept of race always already connected to empire, always already connected to predatory capitalist expansion, always already connected to forms of patriarchal practices, on and on and on, the homophobic practices, the transphobic factors, losing sight of the humanity of Jewish brothers and sisters and Arab brothers and sisters and Muslim brothers and sisters. We could go on and on and on. And this is not PC chit chat. This is Veritas, a quest for truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak.